So I guess we should start with saying wow. For <laughs> <laughs> Can we do that? Just say that wow. Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so what a lovely journey um, through a family that's been through despair, triumph, adversity, but to arrive at this point where it's a celebration of her life and the celebration of Kenya as a nation. So thank you so much, Alia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so as before we start, I mean, would we like to, would you like to sort of talk about the necklace that you're wearing and the significance of it? Oh, thank you for asking me this, uh, this Zahid. So um, this necklace, let me stand so you can see properly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> The morning after, the morning that we were burying my grandfather Raju, I went out into the garden and it had rained the night before and you know how beautiful Nairobi can be when it, the air is crisp and the grass was lush and there was dewdrops and I just thought about how the way it felt like the earth was welcoming their son into the soil. And that's the inspiration. So then I made this necklace to remember that moment and kind of remember that there's beauty even in moments of deep anguish and sadness. Um, and earlier we were gonna have a lapel mic, which meant I was gonna have to remove the necklace and I was feeling quite sad about it. And then the lapel mic would not work. <laughs> the necklace was like, I will be worn. <laughs> so thank you for asking me that question. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, so Let's start this journey in terms of that I would like you to imagine that as all this happened and you were growing up, you were overlooking the journey of your grandfather and your parents and all that, that, that happened. Um, and the journey through which your grandfather drives around Gorongoro Drive as he builds this business. Um, and the very beginning of what your grandfather and the community as a whole undergoes this deep trauma that started in 1960s and continues till today. Um, so, for example, at the very start you mentioned him wearing a kaunda suit. Now the kaunda suit, uh, for, for bad or for worse, has become a national symbol again for people who know. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the kaunda suit is is a symbol of the Africanness, you know, of all of us, you know, of the community, but all of us in the sense that we identified when we have these conversations about what is a national dress. I mean, we've got an African dress today that's become a symbol of what sort of ties many business people and things together. But then this funny thing happens, or this traumatic thing happens of the Arusha Declaration. Hmm? And that's one of the beginnings of this, uh, where individuals and the community uh, is shocked, uprooted, deprived, robbed of their inheritance. Any recollections of what your father talked about it? Maybe what he told his, his son, you know, and then that's your father and your mother. Any reflections on that? You know, I think there was a, my grandfather had a sense, he really was an East African citizen, you know, in, in as much as, you know, borders are very much, this, this idea of borders is very much an enforced identity, but, you know, he, he was born in Uganda, he lived in Tanzania and then moved to Kenya, and he has very fond memories of each of these spaces. And I think for him, the emotion of being forced to leave a place that he was starting to make home was something that was difficult. He had emotional ties to the space. Like you said, he was building a family. You know, they had little children. And I think there was also a, a sense in the air that it was the 60s, there was a sense of freedom in some ways and a sense of like now, you know, now we get to live without fear, we get to live, you know, we get to shape these spaces that we belong to. Um, and I think that in a way that was the beginning of a pulling back from the Asian community, I think that uh, for how I hear it being spoken of is that 
there was early, what felt like at the time, and I think we need to, to interrogate this, but what felt like at the time betrayals meant that then I think a lot of the Asian community started pulling back from national affairs, questioning whether they really could get comfortable and settle roots because how long before they were pushed out. Um, and that idea of being pushed out over the 60s and the 70s was a very real fear. So it's this weird feeling of both deep emotion and homemaking. You know, Raju, my grandparents were both born in East Africa. They had, my grand, Raju never went to India, neither did Shirin. They have no connection to India beyond our rituals. So, you know, East Africa was the home that they had made of it, that they understood, but also being aware that home could push you out. So this twin feeling lived in them really all their lives. Um, and yet their next port of stop is Mombasa. Um, and, the, you know, and the, what it does to the business and things. But again, the pull and the connection to Indian Ocean, yes. which you celebrate till today, because every time you go down to Mombasa, you post these wonderful pictures of dabbling in the water, touching the sand, feeling this thing, you know, and yet, you know, that whole migration sort of comes to a full circle. You know, how does it make you feel today? You know? Thank you for asking that, Zahid. You know, the Indian Ocean, or as I like to call now, you know, I've borrowed this term from, from Yvonne, the Swahili Seas, really does feel like an umbilical cord in some ways. I really, I, our, my family, I wonder about yours, Zahid, I'd love to ask you this. My family, we, you know, one of the things that happens in these long journeys is that we lose our stories along the way. And a lot of the men died very young, and the women were struggling with many children to survive. And the last thing that was on their mind is, is, is keeping the stories alive. It became a very practical, functional life. And so, you know, there's almost like a fracture in our personal histories. And I'm really drawn to that fracture to try and I guess, like, you know, make sense of it, maybe try and heal it in some way. When I go to the Swahili Seas, I think about how, even though this is not a narrative that is perpetuated, the Indian Ocean and Swahili Sea communities affected one another over years. We were in relationship with each other well beyond, you know, this narrative that Asians only arrived with the advent of the railway. That's not true at all. We've been traveling to and fro, one, you know, our spaces for, for generations, for centuries. Um, and I think about that journey, if I, if I may tell a, a little story. Sotan Somji, who's an ethnographer, has written this really beautiful book called Bead By. And, um, you know, he, he explores the passage from, you know, the Indian Ocean to, uh, you know, from India to the East African coast. And, you know, when you start thinking about what that meant for a family, for an individual, I think about my great, great grandmother standing on the shores, you know, not knowing what was waiting for her ahead, what did she pack, you know, did she pack her saris? Did she pack her spices? What plants did they bring with them? You know, she stepped on that dhow, and they, in the dhow, they had a pile of rocks and gunias, snack, sacks. And essentially what the pile of rocks and gunias represented is the people that would die along the voyage that would need to be thrown overboard. This was a treacherous journey, it, you know, and. I imagine what it must have been like to stand, sit on that dhow and look at that rock and say, that might be me, that might be a loved one. I think about all the loved ones that are in the ocean. Um, Christina Sharp talks about you know, the Atlantic passage and in, in her incredible book, In the Wake, and this half-life of blood being, I think, a million years, like blood survives for, please don't quote me, but for a remarkable amount of time. So when I'm in, this, in the Swahili seas, I feel like, this is gonna sound weird, but it's okay. It does feel like I'm like returning, like I'm with my ancestors. I'm trying to listen out for the stories that we lost. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so, so that journey then brings us to the Karim's Electric Bakery yes. in, in Mombasa. Um, and you know, things didn't go according to plan and they decided that they need to move on. Um, and then they have this, this you, this particular owner who says, you are the only Indian that I like, I don't know how, 
well, but I like you, you know? Um, and this particular affinity between people who share histories, who share cultures in the areas that they live, you know, and it and it happens even today. I'm sure it, it's it's it, it's happened to you that um, that amid um, the often raw, sometimes emotion, sometimes uh, ethnic, sometimes racism, you get this individual who recognizes you for who you are, for your integrity, for your honesty. You know, and that's a trait that sort of you know the South Asian community comes with. You know, uh, and how does this sort of uh, how does it, as you've got into business and you've got into other things, uh, how does it sit with you? You know, what are, what are your ethics, you know, in that sense? I mean, that's a great question. I think there was a conversation a couple of years ago around what our values are as Kenyans. There's been, I think, an ongoing conversation around that is what is our value framework as Kenyans? And I think the NCIC at some mm. point was interrogating this. You know, I think it was around, I don't, was it after the post election yeah, season? After, yeah. You know, what do we stand for? Who are we? Um, you know, I think my generation inherited, um, inherited a narrative that was taught to us by a very, by the colonial imposed education system, which very much div was about divide and rule, was very much about the Maasai are fierce warriors, the Kikuyu are shifty shopkeepers, the Muindis are, you know, that was, the, the and we'll still hear those stereotypes to this day. That was the narratives that were passed on unthinking. And I think one of the things that is really powerful about storytelling is this way that we get to encounter one another's humanity beyond those stories. One thing I think we've not been very good at, Zahid, is as the Asian community, we very much have retreated. Um, and I, and I, will, I would like to ask you the political, con like the context of how why that has happened. Um, Zahid has an really has an incredible understanding of the history, you know, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. But what that's meant is that, you know, in, if you look at Nairobi and you look at how we were literally physically divided from one another, it meant that we didn't live with one another. So we didn't love each other. We didn't see each other's you know, vulnerabilities, our anguishes, our sadnesses. You know, we were forced to see, we were forced to see each other as competition. And I think that this is one of the things where really, we really need to work on. And, you know, one of those original, I think, wounds that needs healing. Um, I, I think in, in relation to, you know, what, where does the South Asian community sit? within Kenya and East Africa as a whole, is really the story of colonialism and neocolonialism. And in the, and in, in the sense that uh, the South Asian community very earlier on, uh, you know, in the early 20s, 30s, you know, got involved politically. Uh, they had, you know, the likes of uh, Jivanji, whose who, uh, Jivanji Gardens is named of after today. He led, you know, a relentless uh, quest against British colonialism. Uh, simply because he he wasn't asking for special rights, he just says we just want equal rights as a as a as as a community. Got hounded out, died bankrupt, you know. But having left a legacy of saying I won't let this go, you know. But then you know the different traumas that have happened. Uh, you start with the uh, Arusha thing that happened, and I mean I, I think all of us need to read a little bit more about what that period stood for. So, you know, many have equated it to be, to, you know, to be racism and stuff, and yet it was a step in the direction of finding a country and sort of claiming, um, you know, uh, uh, claiming their own identity away from colonialism. And I think, you know, some, some great books on, on uh, Nyerere's journey and Tanzania's journey. Uh, Karim Hirji, who is now based uh, in, uh, in, in Dar es Salaam, has written this wonderful series of books on, on, on Tanzania, and they're available on our website. But he's, he's got what this one book he talks about growing up with Tanzania, because he literally grew up and what those struggles were, you know? Um, but then you get a series of these things where, 
where British colonialism and post and post independence governments have done in terms of usually, uh, you know, the, there was the Arusha Declaration, but then there is the Africanization and the Kenyanization, so-called it wasn't Kenyanization, uh, you know, of uh, Kenyan businesses of which your parents were victims of. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the 1982 coup, you know, in, in which, the, the, I, I, I would just like to clarify the 1982 coup affected everybody. You know, but in the context of this very small community that lost a lot of its wealth and stuff because it had, you know, forefront uh, businesses and things. Um, and so, you know, those traumas and of course, and then the, the whole Ugandan expulsion, you know, those traumas of constant hunting down of, of a business community simply because there they, they were businesses Yes, there may have been questions of political allegiance and things, but the, the very unfair uh, thing of saying that every time somebody from the community did something that annoyed the powers that be, instead of taking that person, that community, that group of people through the law, through the rule of law, and saying, look, you know, you committed an economic crime, the country's constitution says this, and you'll get jailed for whatever, or you pay back the money. They resorted to this, this completely unforgivable uh, phenomena of expelling people. And that expelling of, 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 of people, while it was, it, it, and we are talking about it now, but it's happened in Kenya today. I mean, the post-election violence showed mass exodus of uh, communities. Today we've got attacks on, on, on property, you know, of, of people. This morning there's something on Twitter about this person, his family being uprooted from Tigoni or something. And so it, it's, it's become this whole class thing of, of uh, using impunity, using law, you know, to sort of traumatize people, you know? And, you know, there are ways in which I think the narrative has once again, it's that sort of colonial inheritance of pitting one group against another. Um, I think the story, as all stories, is more nuanced. You know, in uh, this, I mean, m my hundred years, um, which, uh, you know, it, it doesn't touch on the pre, on sort of the colonial period as much. Um, but a lot of that was the foundation right, o of what we're still battling with today as communities. And, you know, we, a lot of our history has also been kept from us. You know, I, uh, we hear about Pinto, but do we really understand, you know, w Pinto's ideologies, what he stood for? We hear about Muck and Singh, you know, like, these, it's, it's, these stories deserve um, depth and range because, there is, tends to be one narrative that tends to dominate the, you know, the mainstream media. And it's a much more complicated story than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming to your story in the sense that the destruction of the giraffe restaurant is again that happens, something continues today. In, in the sense that you get people going into houses, into businesses, destroying simply because they want to take it over. And this complete impunity and the lack of rule of law makes it very vulnerable for countries such as ours, you know, to continue thriving. I mean, and I think that whether you're white or you're brown or you're black, it, you know, you are a citizen of a country, you are subject to the, the, to, to the laws of the country and there should never be any excuse to invade destroy, you know, and traumatize families and... and yeah. Hmm? I mean, even this idea of citizenship, right, Zahid is so contentious because the truth is there are some communities in Kenya that don't even, you know, that aren't recognized as rightfully belonging to this land, even though they have for a long time. It's like, um, you'll remember when we were designated the 44th tribe, the Asians were designated the 44th tribe, uh, of Kenya, and you know, I remember thinking, well, tribe is the language of belonging. You know, there are people, there are communities that should have been accepted way before the Asian community, but once again, there's a political, uh, often a political agenda at play. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that sort of, um, you know, as to, as to who we are, and yet through, 
through, through your recitation, you talk about the celebration of the safari rally, and you talk about those great things that brought us people together, you know, whether we won awards in athletics, you know, and stuff like that. And I think, you know, those, those types of events uh, are, are, are really ties that bind us, you know, to this country, you know. Very much so. I mean, Kenyans, <laughs> we've been through a lot, as in, I think that's one of the things that is so beautiful is this picking up, like just the constant, you know, through all of this, you get up and you, f you know, you face the next day. And um, I think one of the things, again, is that you hear these big events and we often don't get to hear actually what that means in people's lives. Um, coming very quickly uh, to uh, the, the, the collapse, not even the collapse, the looting of, of Imperial Bank and all the banks that have gone on since then, you know, where people's, you know, whole life savings have been destroyed. Um, what does it say about, in, in, in the sense that amid all this trauma, you said at least we had a roof over our head. You know, and it, it's something that, uh, that I and, and my partner and a family keep saying at the worst of times, that at least we have a roof over our head and maybe one meal a day. Uh, I, I just am interested in, in hearing a little bit about uh, the emotional conversations and, um, you know, and, uh, and how families, you know, like yours in this instance, stayed and hugged together as they went through this very traumatic phase of being pauperized almost overnight. You know, and, and, and what have been the dynamics of the family and how does it sort of reflect today in terms of how you live as a family within a community? You know, I mean, Zahid, I will say, you know, at the very beginning, we had an enormous amount of privilege even as the bank collapsed, that we had money in the bank, that we had a roof over our head, that we had people who could come with envelopes, that we had networks that we could access, that we could start again. You know, there are people I know who, there are, and this is documented, there are people who died because they couldn't buy medicine, couldn't access, you know, medical help. Um, there, this was truly a shattering um, encounter for a lot of families. I think one of the beautiful things about communities and, you know, communities within Kenya is we really do rally together. We have that Harambe culture that expresses its way in different forms. We, ha we are used to taking care of one another. It's what we do. I think it's what made us incredibly resilient during COVID. This idea of mutual aid is not new to us. We've been doing it for a long time. Even the HIV AIDS pandemic when, you know, communities had, you know, their, their loved ones, you know, passing on, breadwinners of the family, trying to find ways to survive. That was something that these support mechanisms were developed and strengthened. And I think the hardest thing is, you know, is the hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the hardest thing, the hope. And that's why, you know, and I don't say this lightly, Kenyans on Twitter gave us hope. Out of everything else, that was the most valuable thing. Um, I th homes around the world are becoming increasingly precarious. I think gone are those days where you know you have stability lasting, you know. Um, I think this idea of things being ripped out from under your feet is becoming a more common experience and will do even with the climate, um, you know, with, with what we're experiencing with the climate, with political situations. And so I think, yeah, you've got to, somehow you've got to keep that hope alive. That's the thing that gets you going one day to the next. And the transition of wow, uh, the, the young one in the family and wow, the business, you know, um, what is, what, what, you know, how is, how is your nephew growing up in terms of being the next generation that's going to have to somehow either get involved in the business, take in or, or um, sort of imbibe the spirit, you know, and the strength to sort of move forward as, you know, as you all progress with your lives? He's chaotic, which I love. He, 
he began the whole experimentation. He said to me one day, Masi, so that's what he calls me. Masi is mother, uh, sister of, of mother. Masi, do you think you could make me a blueberry samosa? And blueberry is blueberries. <laughs> and I was like, well, we shall try. So I went to, to where I always go, Twitter. <laughs> I was like, hey, Twira, can you help me? What would you put in a blueberry samosa? And there was answers, everything from like, um, I can't even remember now what it was, but we made a series of blueberry samosas. And I love this like audacious, just we're gonna do things differently. Um, he comes now to the, so we, you know, to the kitchen, the factory, he calls it the factory, and he's like, he'll tell people who come in, can you believe such a small boy named such a big business? We are not a big business. But it's just, it's really lovely to see him engaging. He's learning how to fold samosas. Um, I, you know, I will be honest, I'm actually quite a pessimistic person. You know, I think, I believe we're living truly in apocalyptic times. I don't know what that means for the little ones. I don't know. Nothing, everything to me just feels, the word was ephemeral used in the Kenya Wright session. I love that word. Everything does feel ephemeral. So, you know, if none of it is going to be here, we might as well try and make the most of every moment that we do have, right? That's kind of become my attitude. Uh, just to mention that Alia and ourselves have a journey that is again samosa related in the sense that we had the samosa festival, was it 2006 or 8 or something, I don't remember, and, and part of the festival, you know, what we do is to bring cultural uh, items together and Alia did this wonderful display of jewelry and, and different permutations of, of, of wearings. And I wonder if you have a video of it or do you have any pictures of what you did. But she had this wonderful uh, display at uh, the Ramoma Gallery, which is now closed, you know. Yeah. You know um, and, and, and the fact that her journey through Samosa really interacts with our journey as why we established the, the Samosa Festival, which is basically a fusion and celebration of, of cultures. So, it is, so in the sense that I think, uh, you know, the rivers have continuously sort of meet and live and stuff, and I and this is not going to be the end; it's rather the beginning of a journey, like we've talked about. And can I mention Zahid? So, you know, I I um I did not know growing up much about the Asian communities' involvement or participation in the forming and the shaping of Kenya. Um, the newspapers were awash, you know, I came to consciousness, at, you know, when Putney was robbing the country, you know. Um, generally, the brown faces I saw in the media were, were people who were doing great damage to the country. And when I started getting it, you know, when I would start uh, voicing my views about the country, my dad would say, you know, don't get involved. We tried once and we were told to keep our mouth shut, don't do it. And I just kept feeling like, no, there's something else out there. And I met Zahid and Zarina Patel, who are the founders and uh, memory keepers of this community. They, they run Avaz magazine, it's the 24th year, right? Zahid, 24th year, really shedding light and exploring these deeper narratives of uh, consciousness, of Asian participation, just incredible, incredible work. And then the Sal Samosa Festival was like where I really like fell in, South Asian Mosaic of Society in the Arts. Um, and this was my first opening to, oh my goodness, there's more to this story. There's more that we've done. Zarina Patel, who's in the audience, I won't embarrass her, but she is, you know, she led with other people, but the struggle against Moy taking over Jivanji Gardens. He wanted to build a parking lot in that space. And this was a space that was Nairobi's public space. Um, there's ways that we've contributed and participated that I had no idea. I'm really grateful to you, Zahid, for holding that memory and also for holding the histories um, and sharing them with the younger generations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Should we? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, should we open up the, the sure. conversation? Yeah. So maybe members of the audience, uh, comments, questions. Uh, maybe they could pull, pull up the lights a little bit as well in the audience, so we could just see. There's a hand over there. There is? Okay. I can't see, but yes, please. And, uh, could the mic be given to Oh, much that better. Person? Yeah, yeah, much that's better. good. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you. Ah, super. Oh, yes, that's thank you. Better. That's thank you. much better. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Uh, could you please stand up so we could see you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I don't know how to fix this. Oh, <laughs> uh, would yeah. Would mic? yeah, you use, use that mic, mic yeah. And beauty make. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Dali, and my pronouns are they, them. And uh, thanks for sharing the 100 years of samosas. And what stood out for me is the way, the, the starting over uh, with all the xenophobia, I didn't want to call it that, but it spoke volumes, especially around now, uh, refugees in Kenya, you know, the laws kind of affect them and you usually don't have a say in how the country you've known as home uh, is, being, is being run. Yeah, so thanks for saying that and also sharing that story. Yes, yeah, somebody, uh, think Mutoni. Well, what an extraordinary morning. Thank you so much, um, Alea and uh, Rajan, for all the work that you do, because I think that stories are so important um, in humanizing us to each other or with each other. And, um, and Zarina, wherever you are, you know, my fan, okay? <laughs> um, so my question is, on my way here in the taxi, you know, I told them what I'm coming to do, and the taxi driver told me, but Asians always refuse to marry us. Why don't they let us marry their daughters? And I thought, this is an issue I've had, I, you know, for years and years, but I've never really heard the Asian community talk about it. You know, it's always been the sensationalist stuff that you kind of read in the media and what have you. And then I thought that maybe it comes from sort of a deeper longing for connection. So not necessarily marriage itself, but the feeling that if you have an event like this, the Asian community is there, and that when you have an event hosted by the Asian community, the African community is there, much like you see in other parts of the world that are multicultural. And for some reason, um, the white community is very present generally at these sort of things, but the Asian community isn't. And so I just wondered if you'd just sort of address that because I know you have the shoulders to, to take the implied criticism there. <laughs> um, no, it's not criticism at all. I think it is a valid concern. Um, I, I think there are various things, and I think you are very, you're very right in saying that what the, what the taxi driver was asking is where is the integration uh, and not necessarily marriage and marriage was just an expression of uh, what it was and I and I agree that there in very many ways I mean I know I, I, I firmly believe that we'll that we still live in a very apartheid society um, the way our schools are where we live how we interact you know what are our where do we interact in stuff? So there is a, there is a general. Um, I, I think I firmly believe, and I think we as ours do, is that the trauma of this country, in terms of brutalizing communities, whether it's the South Asians or it is the Luos or it is other groups that are not in power or this thing, I think the marginalization. Um, that the division and the violence on, on communities has made us what we are. 
Having said that, I think we've never got rid of the colonial structure in terms of where we live, our education system, how is equity expressed, you know, in, in I mean, for example, this, this economy actively promotes privatization of everything. So that you privatize education, you privatize transport, you privatize where we live, you know, instead of the, the, the one thing that, that, that sort of people don't talk about is what did Nyerere do? In all that, one of the things that he did was he dismantled the colonial state. And he brought about a sense, you know, that today, for example, the South Asians in, in, uh, in Tanzania are very different from the South Asians here. Their identity, the grasp of the language, the way they live, because there was a fundamentally restructuring of a society that made the idea of equity and equality right across the country. Yes, it's not been perfect. Yes, it's had its uh, traumatic moments. But it was an experiment in, in courage, in political conviction, and economic transformation, transformation that people don't talk about. But here, I think the, the, the fact that we, we have a very small working class, even out of the South Asian community, who are mechanics, who are, you know, who do things, you know, in, in a very small way, and, they, and they're, very, they're very, very small. But to add of it, to, to add to it, the sheer trauma of every time, I mean, look at what happened over the, 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 the rye business. You know, how can you talk, talk, if he and his business committed a crime, Go for him as an individual. Do what needs to be done. Apply the law. Apply the the issue of equity in an economy that 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 has certain standards. But when you start when you start using communities and saying you 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 stop, you leave, or we'll kill you, what does it do? I mean, for a community that is so small. I mean, like you know, it was a hundred thousand at one point. Now it's fifty thousand and less. When you hear words like that, what do they do? They just shrink, you know, and they just retreat into this, you know. And therefore, the larger perception of lack of integration, it's really due to the neo-colonial state. And I think, I, I think that is a major issue that needs to be looked at. Would you like to say something? Yeah, and uh, to complicate that narrative a bit more, I've been asked that a lot, actually. And I think there's an there's an intimacy that's being, I think you're right, about the longing. Um, you know, the Asian community itself is made up of how many different sub-communities, and each one is so distinct. The Goan communities, beliefs and attitudes is not the same as the Ismaili communities, is not the same as even within the Hindu community, and even, in, even intermarriage within the Asian community is complicated and often frowned upon. So even before we transcend color, there's already you know, that complication. And I will say there is an element of racism at play. And I think this does come straight from India. I think we have to call it out for what it is. There is the neo-colonialism, but also you know, there is the colonial structure. And also, we have to look deep into our own hearts and say, actually, what, what, what is our belief system that's holding this behavior up generation after generation? I think it's changing. I really do believe that. I think um, there's now it's, I think, a little bit more of a class issue than it is a race issue in the same way. You know, the Asian experience in the Caribbean is very different from here. There was a lot more integration in the Caribbean, a lot more intermarriage. Um, I do think the moment we start loving ourselves loudly, in a way, we'll have begun winning that challenge. Um, and also, I'd just like to, you know, to share like the work of the storytelling. You know, Madani Garland here is, you know, the founder of Story Moja, and my my first my first taste of stories. Um, thank you, Madani, for that work that you've done, that you continue to do. You know, that's the. I think that's what starts to shift things. What starts to make people question. Um, it, the, 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 the politics and the power play is insidious and it's strong, which means we must invest in the cultural shifts with as much intention because that's where the real change is going to happen. We're, it's, it's a battle. 
you know, so to speak, like, and, and the politics is playing hard. So as cultural people, we need to step up and also play hard. Yes, there's somebody there. Any, sorry, maybe on that side? Uh, is there that person with a white shirt there? Okay, sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so, how are you? Hi. Um, I mean, I guess my question initially was in a way similar to what you were asking with respect to, to intermarriage, and this is coming from someone that is South Asian, uh, East African mixed. Um, who, upon moving to East Africa, did not find people that looked like me as I was hoping I would. Uh, the aspect of like, you know, that political change, that kind of macro level change, really does start with the social shift though, when it comes to integration, when it comes, whether it's marriage, whether it's um, how you share spaces. But there's also a component of, when it comes to the colonialism aspect, the system that was put in place was a system of putting South Asians in a superior position, um, putting South Asians in a position to economically gain more than the population, like the Kenyan black, Kenyan population, the black Ugandan population. And I guess, how do you reconcile or how do you start to reconcile that very real component of it and the real ramifications when it comes to generational wealth, when it comes to, uh, you know, generational pain, uh, all of that. Do you want to? Thank you very much for pointing that out. I think that that is part of the story that gets missed a lot and really is, f the, the first we have to begin by articulating it, by naming it and by putting it out in the public space. This was not a level playing field, right? There has, and that, that was the colonial, thing of hierarchies, absolutely the Asian community had advantage. And then they did continue to consolidate those advantages. It makes sense that there are tensions that arise from that. It makes absolute sense. I also think the Asian community sometimes, um, more often than not, have not accepted that they had this level of privilege and also have, have taken in certain situations a larger sort of victim role in these narratives. And I think we see it again with the ex Ugandan expo expulsion. It wasn't just the Asians that were, you know, um, that experienced this, you know, devastation from Idi Amin. It was many communities. The other thing too is because we are such a small minority, every action uh, amplifies, so to speak. Um, but thank you so much for pointing that out. How we reconcile it, you know, and then, and then the conversation around reparations, around land ownership, around businesses, around, you know, I think those are very difficult conversations that we need to start having and that need to really be led by the Asian community, if I'm honest. Um, and I'm hoping maybe, Zahid, we might find a platform with that within of us. I mean, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, th I think it, it's, it's a larger systemic problem, and in the sense that the systemic inequality has never been addressed, till today continues to be that privilege, whether it's white, black, brown, is the order of the day. Um, and, I, and I think until that is sort of dismantled, interrogated, and negotiated, you'll continue having this kind of thing. It is very difficult. I mean, we've seen the conversations in Zimbabwe and in South Africa around land reform uh, and, and how do you bring equity and things. And, and I mean, sadly enough, uh, you know, the, the present re regime has, has used the narrative of a hustler regime is saying, we'll give you money. And then, you know, you do what you give, you take away from, from you know, another way by, by selling the economy to the Bretton Woods institutions completely. So that the, 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 the capture by, by, by neocolonialism and the, and the deliberate uh, attempt in whatever way to retain class privilege until it is addressed through proper equity, 
uh, I think we'll never get there, you know. And unfortunately, we are on this raw capitalist brand of running this this country, and you know, and and I'm sure it's it's the same kind of dynamics, perhaps less stark in both Tanzania and and uh, Uganda. I think until we address that, as to how do you restructure an economy in such a way that you address, so that you do, so that the people who have the know-how, the people who have the capital are then restructured in such a way that you build institutions and you build businesses and you, um, and, and you make sure that the wealth is not just an exploitative nature, but it becomes a wealth of the nation to create equality all around. It is a, it's a humongous task, but you must have a leadership that truly believes that they want to create equality want to create equity and by chasing people away and by traumatizing communities is not the way to go certainly and i think we've seen it all over the world i do think i i do think that there is a personal role in that because i think yes we had there's big systemic issues and i guess you know that can feel hopeless it can feel that then I have no role to play in this world that I live in. And I guess my, my call to fellow Asians in the space is to say, really, we need to start engaging on this on an individual level. And I think taking more responsibility, I think having these uncomfortable conversations. My generation has been very comfortable with the privileges that we have inherited and then get very comfortable around the search for wealth as that, that you know, they don't feel like they need to engage in the, com in the country aside from, you know, the, the economy. And I'm calling, I'm calling you out and myself, <laughs> which is to say, like, these are the spaces that we also must engage in. And also beyond spaces like this, I think um, it, it, there has to be, in, I, I'm a big believer, like, the, the feminist principle of you do what you can where you are with what you have. And that is what starts to also help shift those systemic uh, structures. And just to say that I that the charity is not the way, okay, yeah. at all, okay, and uh, that needs to be recognized. Yeah, thank, thank you. you right. Where would you like to go there? Right. Sorry, did you say that? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Utsav. Uh, I'm from India. I came to Kenya in 2019, and uh, it was very interesting to see Kenya's journey uh, and you know the struggles that we discussed today, um, and also juxtapose that against what India has experienced and what's happened in um, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Kigali in Rwanda, and um, <coughs> it's uh, thank you for sharing your story first of all. Uh, but I also want to ask: you mentioned that you know we are living in apocalyptic times and. Uh, we're facing inflation and we're facing uh, instability and all kinds of challenges. So I'd like to ask you, um, what are the things that you know you see coming which uh, might divide us further? And what are the things that hold us together? And briefly maybe comment on um, what are the you know foundations of those two things that we should think and reflect on and, and focus on uh, to build this sort of you know consensus and spirit moving forward? Thank you. Oh my goodness. That's like the question of our times. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in what we can learn from the spaces that we belong to and the ways that we have been in the past. I'm very interested in, in all the various areas, whether it is the way our relationship with the earth, whether it's our relationship with the history, our relationship with one another. I think that, you know, what we're doing as the world, you know, the, I, generally the whole, that whole sort of capitalist consumerist beast is not working for us. 
right? And it, there are many ways. That is not the only way. I'm interested also in the little things because I think if we think too big, it can become overwhelming and despair sets in. So what does it look like, for example, to take care of the earth and to take care of one another? And the people who teach me that is African women. African women are very, you know, we have a long history of taking care of the earth and one another in little practical, you know, um, sustainable ways. I think it's about really um, interrogating that, about giving it the value, the importance and the recognition that it deserves. I think it's not about adopting Western futuristic ways en masse, but I think it's about really thinking about where you belong and looking at what the solutions are for where you are. We're, essentially, we're going to be in a battle for resources, right? It's, it's air, it's, it's water, it's, uh, it's, it's the intellectual resources, you know. Um, what does it look like to take care of one another? But the only way through this is together. I mean, that's, it's very clear. There's no other way. So what does together look like in this world, even with AI, right? There's no escaping that. What does, what, does, uh, what does that look like for us? Um, I don't have the answers, really only questions, and maybe places that I'm interested in looking at. Um, I think that we have to connect. You know, I think, um, it, to me, it feels like I'm feeling more alone than I ever have, and the only way to get hope is with one another, to connect with one another. It sounds so, I wish I had a greater answer than that, but I really think it's finding those moments of connection and beauty and joy and support um, that reminds, like that is your, the core of your humanity because when you think of, just on a local level, right? When you think of, I wake up the mo in the morning and I think about the rising fuel prices, I think about taxes, I think about how am I going to survive the next day, I think about where, I think we're in a battle against despair. And I think that whatever that battle looks like against for you is what you need to hold on to. Um, I have a slightly different view to that uh, in, the, in the sense that I feel uh, that the solutions are really about us getting involved in people's movements. Uh, in the sense that we are all aware of the right-wing backlash in terms of regimes taking over, uh, destroying Earth by using, by ignoring all the signs. The disruption has gone on for the last hundred years or more. And I think that the people are, there's enormous amount of organizing and solidarity going around, whether it's in the US where the, the First Nations people and people as a whole are fighting against oil and, uh, and, and coal and, and et cetera, or all that, uh, or the organizing that is going on on the African continent as well. I mean, a lot of rhetoric of, yes, we believe in this, and then we know what the reality is. But even the destruction of the Indian subcontinent, uh, you know, in, this, in the present leadership that is going on, uh, hundreds of people have been thrown off their land, but there have been hundreds of new movements that have come in. And I, uh, it, is, it is depressing to say this, but it's also very gratifying. I mean, I, we believe in like solidarity in terms of working with the people's movements, identifying and doing what you can. And despite everything, the one thing you don't do is sell your own soul and have your integrity as a human being. If everybody else is rotten around you, or at least if the people you immediately, does not mean that you become one of them, that you stand out and you stand out for the truth, that you celebrate the, the, the victories and the celebration of, of, of the peoples of the world who have said, no, enough is enough, and another world is possible. Thank you. I think a last question, that's it, yeah. Oh, sorry, they've got five minutes, so maybe we'll, we'll get more than one. Let's see what happens. Hi, so thank you so much for your story. Um, I really liked this aspect of encountering East Africa, 
and how disconnected we are from our history. Because in, I was hanging out with a Tanzanian friend of mine. We are walking together with a passport written East African community. But the more we talk to each other, I realize, oh, here we glorify Ujama. But in real sense, like when you go and start to dig deep into these questions of what was really happening, Tanzanians are like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> it's like we don't know what's happening. And I like this aspect of, so what's really happening? Because we don't question why we have all these hostilities, why is one community retreating, and what's, what's really happening? So I really appreciate that aspect. So mine is a question in construction, a question suggestion, it's, we have like Mudoni does story moja. You have Lam Sisterhood, I'm saying Samosa Festival, Awaz Magazine. So in what ways can we work together to contribute in the construction of stories and enriching all our communities to understand what is happening? I think so, yeah, I think that's what uh, Alia is saying. I mean, I think w what, w what's happening is happening all over, is that we all work in pockets, you know, uh, this festival and then that, and, and, I, and there is a common thread that we've all got to build a narrative that looks at the cohesion of, of societies, and if we all recognize that each one of us has got a small platform, you know, then maybe we should bring those platforms together and have a collective of storytellers, uh, you know, which which will bring in Alia and Muthoni and yourself and ourselves and and you know and uh, and and the Bakonde Festival and everybody else who is in it. So you have a big tent. You bring everybody together and see what strategies do we work as a larger community to make an impact. And, it, and it's got to be in terms of selflessness, solidarity, and less about what is it in it for me. It is the collective, it's not the individual. I think there's also the thing of like, it's hard, that's a hard ask, I'll be very honest. And I think it's okay for people to be doing the thing they're doing in the spaces they're doing in the ways they're doing it recognizing that already to do this work, to run a creative business in Kenya is hard, right? Like it's already, it's difficult to kind of even make it work from a financial point of view. And then to survive off of it with the people who are in that. I'm kind of curious about what it looks like to release the pressure a little bit from having it be a big thing you know, um, what it looks like. Maybe it's recognizing one another. Maybe that's the first step. Just what you did. What you did right there to say, these are the players I see. These are the people doing the things. I think seeing one another is the first, one of a very valuable and first step. Um, and, you know, drawing the connections. I will also say that I think in Nairobi, we tend to have this thing of, first of all, thinking that Nairobi means Kenya and claiming that our work is Kenyan and it is not. And then two, class-based also. You know, we, often the work doesn't cut across classes. So those are conversations that are also not happening. And I guess it's for us who are in this space to ask these hard questions, so thank you for asking that question. Because then it means we can't be satisfied in just what we're doing. We have to probe deeper to be like, how can this be a bigger conversation than just in the area of comfort that I sit in um, and continue to sit in. So thank you. Okay, oh, Zahid has mentioned that we're now at the top of the hour or half hour, I don't know what that is. Um, thank you all so much for staying with us and these incredible, really thought-provoking questions, for being honest, truly. Um, Zahid, thank you so much for you know, this conversation. I, it, it, I love how you think, we think so differently, um, and it's always a pleasure to sit with someone who thinks differently, but uh, we're going to the same place, you know. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Makondo.